and welcome to Bristol Health Cares. I'm your host, Kurt Barwis. I am the president and CEO of Bristol Health. This program, this program is for you. It's really about how you navigate the system of care, how you access care, and it's really about trying to answer questions you may have and really didn't know who to ask. We are gonna to bring to you professionals, doctors, surgeons, other healthcare professionals throughout our system of care. Maybe people that you've never talked to before or met before, but, but the goal is to really help you understand how to access care when you need it. You're gonna enjoy this program. This program is really for you. So what's important is if there is something that you wanna learn about or know about or guess that you'd like me to host on this show, write us, write us and we'll, we'll try to make that happen for you. So enjoy the program, Bristol Health Cares. Welcome to Bristol Health Cares. I'm your host, Kurt Barwis, President and CEO of Bristol Health. I'm here today with Dr. Barimo. Dr. Barimo is a orthopedic spine surgeon at Bristol Health. Good afternoon, Dr. Barimo. Hey, <laughs> How are Kurt, you? Thanks so much for having me. Uh, it's great to have you here. How about tell us something about yourself? Um, well, I guess the, the easiest question usually people ask is where you're from. So I grew up in Boston, uh, not too far from where we are now. And um, I've always wanted to be a doctor since I can remember. Um, and so I've kind of been geared towards that since I guess like the first grade. And I uh, did my um, med school at Boston University and I did my residency at Henry Ford uh, Hospital System in Detroit. And uh, then I did, um, after I finished my orthopedic residency training, I did a year of fellowship training in spine surgery. Yeah. And so here I am. So when you, when you decided you want to be a doctor, you know, obviously there's wide range of possibilities. Yeah. And so what made you pick orthopedics spine? Um, I think most people, um, will tell you about orthopedics. It's almost like, uh, it's for people who fit a certain mold. And so you kind of are, you have to be smart, right? So that's one thing. You have to be motivated and sort of like a go-getter and a doer. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like being on like a sports team. And so um, I actually did not play high school sports. So this is like one of my last opportunities to get on the teams, uh, so to say. <laughs> so that was part of it too. But all of those things um, kind of fit together and um, sort of, I did like, you know, uh, weightlifting with my friends um, in high school and college too. So I liked anatomy and just all kind of fit together in one profession yeah. that I felt like fit me. Yeah, I love, I love that sports team analogy. And, and, um, and, it, and it really kind of resonates with me because I feel like the team, the leadership team at the health system is just like that. It's okay. we're a team. And, and, and it, just like the team on the field, we all work together. And, yeah. um, and, and whatever you do, doesn't matter where you are in the organization, you're part of that team, right? Yeah. Um, so, so how long have you been at Bristol Health? I'm coming up on a year in a February. A whole year. Yep. So, so what made you choose Bristol Health? Why, why Bristol Health? I mean, you could have gone anywhere. I think there's a couple of key things. Um, you know, when you spend so much time training to do something, you want to actually do it. Yeah. And so, um, you know, part of that is having patients to take care of and a support system to do that. And I felt like Bristol Health offered a really good opportunity for that. Um, so that was a big part of it. Um, and I think there's a lot of, for spine surgery, it's, it's pretty complex, you know. Um, there's a lot of overlap between the spine pathologies that you could have that could be structural, and then other issues that could be medically uh, related, sort of like a neurologic issue, um, and other things that aren't part of orthopedic training. And um, at Bristol, we have sort of a good multidisciplinary um, kind of approach to spine care. And we actually like in the same unit of the, you know, the clinic building. 
And so I can talk to the rheumatologist, um, other orthopedic surgeons, neurology, and um, physical medicine and rehabilitation and pain management in you know, one trip around uh, the floor yeah. about any patient. And so it kind of makes it easier to take care of the patients. It seems like um, it's like a family there. It's like a family atmosphere. You know, you, you work with peers in all different disciplines. Yeah. And and you, you know, the thing that I observe, because I, I walk around that same floor sometimes sure, and sure. run into people, I see that collaboration happening all the time. Yeah. And I see it happening in person. Like you can get up out of your office or exam room and walk down the hallway as opposed to sending a text or a, you know, a confidential message, you can, you can actually have the conversation. And um, do you think that that helps the outcome for patients when they come through the door? Yeah, two, two things. Um, it definitely helps the outcome, you know, because um, two heads are better than one. Yeah. And then uh, in addition to that, it just makes it easier on you as the provider to take care of the patient. Um, because you know, as you know, communication is hard. Yeah. And so anything that makes communication easy or easier is going to help. Yeah. And being able to just walk over to talk to someone without having to call someone's office and, and um, having to go through this long kind of winding tunnel to try to get to the other doctor, yeah. you know, um, just makes it easier. Yeah, and, and you mentioned a lot of specialties um, that you work with. Mm -hmm. Some I hadn't really thought about, but um, you know, the pain program. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of patients come through with back pain, or mm -hmm. you know, and and a lot of times it's not necessarily on their back in their back. It's on their yeah. legs or somewhere yep. else. And yeah, it, and so so how do you approach it so somebody comes in to see you for the first time how does mm -hmm. that work i mean you go through all the analytics and um it's kind of interesting you know because you think back to your training and i and i i finding myself more and more going back to the basics that i learned in med school you yeah. know I don't know what it was about like my training. I thought like, okay, like you kind of get your training wheels in med school and then you're gonna go to residency and learn real medicine. <laughs> but now I'm, I'm finding that I'm using stuff from med school a lot more. Um, and it kind of, you know, you pick up things along the way. But so basically you kind of just start open-ended and um, you try to have the patient set an agenda, have a goal for the visit. Um, and then, you know, from there, you can see whether you're actually even going to be able to help the patient. Um, but once they set the agenda, you can kind of listen to the symptoms that they're having. And then you have ideas of what those symptoms could mean. And then you have to kind of like put them through a battery of tests with the physical exam yeah. to try to see if you can get a physical exam, finding a match, which you have on like to match your hypotheses of what could be going on. Um, hypothesis is uh, just what you think is happening yeah. or could possibly be happening. And um, then once you kind of have a good direction, you look at imaging to see if that matches what you think could be happening. And then um, ultimately, unless there's some kind of emergency, I say, well, this is what we could do for you in orth orthopedics. We have like a very, very small toolkit. We have anti-inflammatory medications and some other medications um, that are non-narcotic, some exercise program or bracing, some anti-inflammatory liquid medication that we place with a needle that's called an injection yep. in surgery, which, you know, is a option of last resort unless, you know, there's an emergency or something urgent going on. And then we start there yeah. and then we see how they do. Most of the time your body heals itself. Um, it just could take up to six to 12 weeks and then um, if it's not getting better. We take it from there. Yeah. So, so talk to me a little bit about the surgical capabilities at the, at the health system. You know, you like it. Is it advanced for you? Do you feel comfortable with what you have there? I mean, when you came, we ordered some things that yeah, we didn't yeah. have before, yeah, and I think yeah. we just ordered some more things for you. Yeah. Um, um, I think we're we're loaded. You know, we have the capability to do a lot of um, straightforward surgery, a lot of complex surgery on the orthopedic end of things. And so um, I think uh, if you look under the hood, um, you know, there's a very big, strong engine. And so um, orthopedic wise, you know, we have 
total hip replacement, total knee replacement, shoulder replacement, reverse total shoulder replacement, um, all the hand surgeries you could ever want. Um, in yeah. terms of the spine, um, you know, we have everything that you need, honestly. Um, and it's kind of hard because with spine surgery, it's not like just one or two main surgeries. It's kind of like 20. Yeah. And so you have to kind of match sort of the surgery to the patient and um, kind of just match a philosophy to the patient. And mainly the philosophy is if you have a structural problem that is not allowing you to live life on your own terms or not allowing you to be independent, then you can choose to live with that, but you don't have to. And we have ways to try to um, try to improve the structure, to try to improve function, and do it in a way that try to pre- tries to preserve motion. You know, yeah. and so um, for example, somebody could be young, thirty-year-old mom, and have a disc herniation. So you know, you're um, in their neck, and so you could have uh, the shock absorber in between your vertebrae can collapse and prolapse a little bit and put pressure on a nerve um, that could give you arm pain or it could put pressure on your spinal cord that could cause you to um, have trouble with your balance and hand coordination. And so I've had a patient like that and, um, you know, usually you wait for it to get better because a lot of times it does get better for whatever reason our body is able to take the pressure off the spinal cord, but sometimes it doesn't happen and the pressure stays there. And so then you're left with the question, do you live with it or not? And, um, you know, she got to the point where she was afraid to carry her baby down the stairs because she was afraid she was going to drop the baby. And so that doesn't work for a mom. Yeah. You know, and so we have tried and true um, procedures that we do where we just take the pressure off. We can put a motion preserving um, device in that allows your spine to move fairly normally and that has a really good track record. And you feel really good about taking care of someone like that. Yeah. And so we have that capability. Um, you know, we've had patients who, for whatever reason, their spine's falling apart and they can't walk. And so you have to put the spine back together. And um, thankfully, because our bodies have an amazing ability to heal themselves, you kind of restore their stability and then the nerves kind of heal themselves. And, you know, everyone can be happy. It's amazing, um, I, I, you know, having had spine surgery myself, Yeah. like that based on where the pain is yeah like if it's your arm here wherever yeah you know you you pretty much know where that is on the spine yeah just by how the person presents yeah and you even know which side it is and which is is absolutely startling to me um you know i i I remember seeing the the spine and then the chart which tells you where it is um and 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 you used a great example of somebody who's afraid to, you know, carry their baby. I mean, that's that's got to be the worst fear of your life, you know. Um, and and what you can do to, you know, help that person overcome that. Yeah. And and myself having, you know, not been able to walk very well for six months, mm-hmm. I can now have total empathy for somebody with that. You know, yeah. I, I, I just. Um, my life changed and yeah. it, it came it, as you just said it came down to this decision of you know all right can i live with this i can't live with this yeah. you know i just can't and um and so i think people need to feel supported through that process too right and that's that's the part that um it, you know often is hard for people because you know they're worried about having surgery they're worried about not being able to ambulate or function the way they should Mm -hmm. um and they're processing you know just like taking a shower or going out and you know getting the newspaper or something like that is a whole different different world so um so it's really it's really amazing to hear you talk about those situations that you know you can have such an incredible impact on somebody's life you know yeah um it has to be, you know, one of the most rewarding things that you've, you have is that you, you, you have somebody that's got this problem and they can't function the way they want to function. And all of a sudden you're able to accomplish that change for them. And you look back and you say, wow. Yeah. Well, you know, we have the sort of, uh, good fortune and pleasure of, um, being able to stand on the shoulder of giants, you know? <laughs> and so like a lot of the surgeries, I'm not inventing the surgery, you know, yeah. they're kind of tried and true. 
and um, you get trained on how to do them and you rehearse in them and you kind of execute. And I feel like I, I'm just happy to, to be able to, to play a role in someone's sort of recovery and their sort of like their win, yeah. you know? Um, you spend so long training, like so long. College, four years of med school, five years of residency, one year of fellowship, and um, you just wanna be able to do what you're trained to do. And um, you know, the success story, you're just happy to be a part of it. Um, that's, that's, a, that's the part that I take, you know? So, so, so in the world of spine surgery, mm -hmm. there's, you know, I, I kind of laughed to myself. My dad had his first surgery. He, he died 90, but he has first spine surgery when he was 20 years old. Okay. 20 years old. Okay. And I think back in all the, the time and how much innovation and how much change has occurred. Yeah. And, and so I wonder like, what's next, you know, where, where's, where's spine surgery going where where's the field going what do you think is going to be the next incredible thing in innovation ah uh, that's a good question that's a good question you know um you got to be careful because of this this thing availability bias where like the thing that you hear about most recently comes to mind and then you yeah. just talk about it yeah um but I, I think overall orthopedic surgery as a whole is moving towards being um sort of less invasive and trying to obtain or meet the same sort of uh, structural goals with less trauma to your body during the surgery. Yeah. And so, um, and then the goal of that is to for you to have, you know, less pain from the surgery, um, quicker recovery and, um, you know, less, I guess, damage to sort of your spine, which is not just the bone, but also the muscles that attach to it. Because we know that down the line, sort of, if we change your spine too much, then, you know, the next level of your spine can be weakened and wear out uh, over time. So we want to prevent yeah. that. Yeah. So, so somebody who has a, uh, you know, a problem. Sure. You know, and, and I, and I see this, you know, a lot of people, you can see actually they're they're limping or they're yeah. walking funny yeah. or you're playing golf or sports or something yeah. like that and and they say, oh, no it's going to be okay mm -hmm. it's going to be okay what's your advice to a person like that is it you know you should get checked out or you know just live with it for as long as you can i mean you know i think if you do have a worry it never hurts to uh come and see um, an orthopedic surgeon. So this is the other thing, you know, um, orthopedic surgeon is kind of a misnomer because you spend your time doing surgery only like 10 to 20% of the time. Yeah. Um, but orthopedist, um, to get an evaluation and let you know if you have something to worry about or not, you know, um, we all, Things fall apart. There's a good yeah. book called Things Fall Apart. Yeah. So um, things fall apart and you just want it to happen slowly and you want to be able to um, enjoy life on your own terms without physical limitations that are unnecessary. And so if you feel like you have a limitation that's not allowing you to live life on your own terms or keep up with your peers, come get checked out. It doesn't hurt. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the things that I've kind of grown to see is as you know i'm getting older sure and people around me are getting older yeah. and older parents and everything and 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 i watched my dad struggle with balance mm -hmm. you know and and so uh he he would say well part of it was you know his hip or this or that you know a lot of ideas about what yeah. it was and what was amazing to me was i brought him to the medical center mm -hmm. And I took them to uh, orthopedics. Mm -hmm. uh, they did all the x-rays, hips, knees, fine, no problems. Um, and then did it, he did, as you described, a neurology consult, mm -hmm. had some blood work done, and he had a vitamin deficiency, yeah. a yeah. massive vitamin yeah. deficiency. Yeah. And, and I, it was an incredible education for me because I, I went to all his exams and um and literally he he had such a serious deficiency that mm -hmm. you know 
after he got his shots, his balance improved dramatically. His, his ability to ambulate without falling. You know, he, he would describe his feet as being, yeah. he couldn't feel his feet. Yeah. Now, I'm not sure how he was still driving a car, but he couldn't feel his feet. So um, there were some, uh, some, some uh, car rims that got dented up quite okay. a bit on okay. curbs. Okay. But, um, you know, so I think, you know, when I, when I hear you talk about, like, this whole system of care, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, here it wasn't necessarily an orthopedic problem. It was, but that was the starting point, which then got the person, my father in this case, into the system. And he went through this whole analytical period of, um, well, what's really going on? Yeah. And can it be improved? Because if you asked him, he had a spine injury when he was 20, mm -hmm. and he blamed everything on that spine injury, right? That's that was common. the problem. That's common. And, and, yeah. and so, you know, what I, what I see is, you know, to your earlier point is it's really, if if your your life is changing and there's an interference with your everyday function mm -hmm. and it's starting to bother you, you got to get checked out. You know, you got to enter so. somewhere. I think so. Um, and what and what was interesting in that particular case is he had gone through some pretty significant um, abdominal surgeries, which mm -hmm. were causing the reason why he wasn't absorbing the vitamins and stuff like that. And you know, so when you look back and you say, and then and it and it really created a pathway for him to to live 10 more years yeah. in a really much better more stable way and feeling good about his independence so, um, so man all this time you spent around doctors you got this right story so people, <laughs> i don't know if it's the right um, story but <laughs> no no you know um i feel like it's kind of just sort of human nature we have to have an explanation for what's happening right or wrong yeah you know so like there could be explanation, well, I've had back surgery when I was 20 and ever since then, nothing's been right. And that story can just be the dominant storyline, whether it's like right or wrong. But, um, you know, your story, I'm like, oh, like, yeah, that, that all makes sense to me, like medically. And um, there are a lot of those areas of sort of gray in, uh, in medicine where um, there's not a specialty for it. There's not really... Yeah a specialty that encompasses all the things that can make your balance be off, you know? Yeah. Um, and so there's like a, that's like a, you know, the crossover between uh, sort of orthopedics and neurology um, and medicine. And so, for example, you could have arthritis in your neck and it could put pressure on your spinal cord and then your brain can have trouble communicating with your legs and you have poor balance. Yeah. You could have, um, periods of time where your blood pressure uh, drops and then you could have poor balance. You could have a um, neurologic issue like a vitamin deficiency and have poor balance yeah. or diabetes and have poor balance. And so you kind of, for those areas of grade, it helps to have um, sort of like a multidisciplinary approach or access to that. And I think that's sort of like one of the things that among many that like, Bristol Health does really well. Yeah, it's it's one of the things that I'm you know most proud of. The other the other thing that I'm I'm really proud of is you know you you hear people talk about well this is a group mm -hmm. you know like and you might have a group of five physicians mm -hmm. and 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 over time you've recruited different ones you know like one one year and the next another year and and you and and but you call them a group mm -hmm. right or a team. Yeah. And and the truth is they may actually all be independently practicing as part of this group. Yeah. But not really be a team. Like yeah, not true. communicate or collaborate or, you know, socialize together mm -hmm. to build what, you know, in the business world we talk about teams, in sports we talk about teams, yeah. and there's a team dynamic and there's this, you know, there's a focus on how do we how do we get them to actually be a team? So mm -hmm. the you know the sum of the parts is greater than you yeah, know yep. the whole. Mm -hmm. And and what I really am proud of is this this concept of teamness yeah. in that building. And I think we started kind of in that in that place. You know, how do you like? And you you've been in different places, right? Mm -hmm. And so so how does that feel to you at at the medical center or as part of that department of orthopedics like 
what makes that happen? Uh, is, it, is it the individuals and their interest and their desire to belong to a team? Um, is, it, is it, you know, how the team was recruited, um, how the team is led? What, what, makes that, what, what makes that tick? Because you mentioned it a lot of times, and mm -hmm. I see, and, and just as you talked about the journey of somebody trying to figure out what's causing their imbalance, yeah. you know, it, it really does take a team to solve that problem, not just one, one doctor. I guess they say life is like golf, right? Everything's backwards. <laughs> you know, they, you know, like you always hear opposites attract. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the other times, like, um, like attracts like, yeah. and um, sort of, the world is tribal, and uh, one of my favorite books on leadership, Primal Leadership, um, just talks about how people kind of want to associate with other people who are like-minded and have similar goals, yeah. particularly in the workplace. And um, I think it just happens. And so you could start with like a nidus where there's one person like that. And then like other people kind of, you put people with the same sort of like vision and goal together, but that's just kind of how it happens. And I feel yeah. like, um, I don't know, the, the company overall sets the, the first group and the company set the culture. And then people either fit into that or they don't, yeah. you know, and um, I'm, I'm happy that we have a really good culture where, you know, we just want to help people. Yeah. And um, we try to work together to do it. You know, um, my colleague saw a patient yesterday and says, this looks like a spine thing. And I looked at her MRI same day. We got a stat MRI. We had, we're both on, um, on board with the same plan of getting this patient better. I saw her this morning. I opened up my clinic 30 minutes earlier, saw her. And, um, you know, we're going to take care of her. So it's sort of, and then orthopedics is just like that in general. Like, yeah. you know, sort of like, you know, I think if you put a bunch of orthopedics who are sort of like same, um, same sort of like level or time in life, you know, you're going to already be like similar and similar minded. And okay. so it just, it just works. So it, for me personally, mm -hmm. um, I don't get that instant, well, not instant gratification, but I don't get that return gratification that you get when you solve some of the problems that you just yeah. described, right? So I kind of live through all of you. Okay. <laughs> so okay. Okay. Uh, so yeah. I love, I, I thrive on the stories because you know, when I think about, you know, um, you know, why people join a healthcare system or mm -hmm. work in healthcare, and it's and it and I think it always comes back to you want to feel good about mm -hmm. what you're doing. You know, you want to oh. feel good that you're helping people, and so the stories that you tell and and sharing that with your team mm -hmm. in the OR in the office, um, it really does help people feel like they're connected. And uh, I love those stories. We we do a safety huddle every day, and mm -hmm. we, we 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 do a safety story or we do a we care story, mm -hmm. and. Um, and you know it's it's really uplifting at the beginning of the day to hear somebody talk about an incredibly you know incredibly great outcome or mm -hmm. something that happened. Um, so so I love hearing those stories and uh, it makes me feel really good and proud to be a part of this team. Um, so so what other trends like are happening in um, in your world? Like what do you see? Like you mentioned um, you mentioned a little bit about. Uh, medication as an option, mm -hmm. right? And there's been dramatic changes in, you know, the use of of narcotics yeah. and things like that. And um, can we just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think um, there's a huge push to uh, decrease narcotic use unless it's absolutely necessary. Um, and we're finding that we are able to do that. Um, just by sort of fine tuning our diagnoses and matching medications to the problem, um, using what we call a multimodal um, pain control approach, which we've been using for a long time, where you use sort of um, different medications together, even though sometimes it can be kind of complex with patients which want to take one medication, but it's better to take three that are not narcotic to get the same effect 
um, and not um, be doped up by a narcotic. Yeah. Um, and then with the minimally invasive surgery, if you have less trauma to the body um, from the surgery, then you have less pain and less of a requirement for surgery. I mean, for a narcotic pain medication. And then, um, you know, this is not like a party line or anything, but I think if you have a structural problem, um, I don't think narcotic pain medication is a solution to coping with it long term. Yeah. You know, I've heard a lot about how over time mm -hmm. the the what you may see as a positive result initially, mm -hmm. you have to take more and more. And then ultimately, the pain medication isn't really solving anything um, or making you feel more comfortable and it has other consequences. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's really, you know, and I am not a pain management. Um, um, well, let me let me backtrack. Pain is very tough, and um, it takes a village to uh, manage pain. So um, no single expert can um, take on all of pain because yeah. pain is multifactorial. Um, part of it can be a structural component, or we call it like um, a biologic. So there's a biopsychosocial model to pain. So the bio could be some kind of like inflammatory condition. Um, it could be a trauma. Um, it can be an arthritis, can be something where there's an overlap between sort of like um, inflammation in your body, like an injury response, even though there's no injury, um, or um, a trauma, like a true trauma, or some other structural issue. Um, and then also, there's a, you know, there's a lot of people who will say that if you do have some stress in your life or... Um, some sort of like unconscious thing that you're having a hard time dealing with, you could, it can manifest in your body and sometimes it's pain. Yeah. And, um, and so that's why it's hard. You cannot have narcotic medication be sort of like the primary thing that addresses pain yeah. because you have to have a structural correlate that you're trying to address. And um, because, you know, the narcotic can address a structural thing and also sort of non-structural things at the same time. And you want to focus on the structural things because that's sort of, I think, a healthier approach. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, those are those are really great comments about it. You know, I, I kind of, you know, I wonder after I listen to you say that, like, um, I mean, it's kind of like one of those really stupid questions. But like, you know, when you're talking no about spine, I, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. thank you. Yeah. But you know, like. I, people talk about getting a good night's sleep mm -hmm. and then they wake up and their back's hurting them yeah. and there's something wrong with my bed. Yeah, 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 <laughs> so, yeah. so always it's, it's like kind of like that, that, um, that thing that people talk about and yeah. then they go out and spend like, you know, a ton of money on a new bed yeah. <laughs> that does all these different things. And, yeah. um, so how, how, you know, when you think about spine health, it does that, does your bed make a big difference? I don't know. Sometimes <laughs> people tell me it worked. It worked. You know, and I was, I just, you know, <laughs> they say, what do you think? I was like, you know what? You tell me what happens, you know, because I don't want to tell them they get it because then it can be a waste of money. They can be upset at me or with me <laughs> or um, they can get, a, you know, change their bed and be really happy. And so um, I know there's for, there's some evidence that, you know, if you have a, a neck problem, yeah. you know, if you have like arthritis and arthritis is pinching a nerve in your neck and it disrupts your sleep, there's some pillows that kind of just keep you in alignment. So you're not kind of like torqued this way. And we do know there's a lot of um, things in orthopedics where like, you know, when you sleep, you kind of can um, bend your neck one way or another and that can kind of affect your sleep. So if yeah. you have carpal tunnel, you know, we give you wrist splints at night so you're not bending this way or that way and um, kind of, you know, putting pressure on the nerve and cutting off the blood flow to the nerve and causing you to wake up and shake your hands. Yeah. Same thing with you have a pinched nerve at your elbow here. Um, we give you some kind of thing to keep your elbow straight at night so that it's not bent. And so like the same thing, you know, there's some cervical pillows that I, that do help people. Yeah. And they just, you know, instead of it going on your head, it kind of like focuses on your neck and keeps you in alignment. So you're not twerking. And then on the physical exam, if someone comes in with a pinched nerve um, in their neck, and we think we, well, we, if we think they have a pinched nerve causing them to have arm pain, we kind of just bend their neck like this. We push down on their head, it's called Sperling's maneuver. Um, and if they have pain down their arm, um, that's sort of our kind of 
diagnostic test to kind of say, well, we think that this physical exam finding matches our hypothesis of a pinched nerve in the neck causing your symptoms. So, you know, in orthopedics, like um, for most <laughs> things, if we think their structure hurts, a structure hurts, our biggest tool is our thumb. But for a nerve, you can't really yeah. push on it, so we kind of just push on your neck. So Got it. There's something to beds and pillows. I just don't really know the exact answer. It sounds like there should be a lot more uh, education, like or analysis done when they when they sell you those expensive beds, because some of those, those beds are really really expensive. Just, just just try it. You can go in there and lay on it for hours without having to buy it. So. <laughs> uh, so, no, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure. That's uh, uh, it's funny because you know if you go and buy one of those things, yeah. that's exactly what they tell you to do, and you walk around the store and you feel kind of awkward because there's like people laying on these beds, you know. Um, yeah. But I, I I I know what you're saying about the pillow because I I've worked really hard on you know. No. Yeah finding the right pillow mm -hmm. and then they change the pillow you can't buy it anymore so it's like yeah but it but it i, I think it's it's something that people talk about and yeah. think about as you especially as you age you know you know because yeah. things start to hurt that didn't hurt before and you wonder why you know and the um the physical therapist don't be mad at me bristol health physical therapy they're fantastic too and they're part of this whole um yeah. multimodal approach and they have a wealth of knowledge that we're just we just don't have we're not trained in that and um i think they're probably the best people to ask if um yeah you know uh a certain pillow or um a bed would help or not yeah so i found that um over time that sort of like their approach matches what we do in orthopedics. So if we're trying to decompress something that is tight, you know, yeah. with the surgery, they try to do it without a surgery with posture um, yeah. or certain stretches. And so um, whatever structural problem can be addressed without surgery, they're probably the ones to kind of. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing you that. say that because there's times when I've got to travel or I've got a speaking engagement or something like that. And my back goes out Yeah, and, uh, and uh, you know, I'm really kind of spoiled in that respect. So I just go over and talk to them Yeah, and they, you know, at lunch, they'll throw me on the table and, you know, and like normally, as you, as you mentioned, you know, it could take a week for me to, you know, overcome whatever it is, a locked yeah. wing or, you know, something's frozen or, you know, a uh, nerve that's pinched. Yeah. And, sometimes it could take like less than 24 hours and I'm normal again from going. So I, yeah. I totally appreciate what you're saying about physical therapy. It, yeah. it, ha it works wonders. Um, there's, there's no question. Um, and, and you know, that's, that's the other part about the program. Mm -hmm. Like, so if you go into the medical center yeah. and I, I don't know how they did it because I remember looking at the plans for the medical center mm -hmm. and I don't ever remember this like massive physical therapy center that looks oh. like it belongs in an NFL, you know, locker room somewhere or, you know, it's sports a nice arena. Space. It's, a nice I, space. it's gotta be the biggest one I've ever seen. Yeah. And it's, and it's, what's really cool about it is it's open, there's windows, so there's yeah. fresh, you know, there's light and I drive by the building in the morning and at night mm -hmm. and I see people in there and, I, I worried that, you know, it wouldn't be filled up, but it's yeah. filled. It's, no, it's, it's filled. absolutely it's filled. It's filled. amazing what they yeah. can do in that center. So, um, and it's all convenient, right? So mm -hmm. they, they just, you're, you guys are on the first floor, mm -hmm. right? And then you just drop down in the elevator and you're yeah. there. Um, it's, um, it's a real, like I said before, it's a source of pride for mm -hmm. the organization to have such a comprehensive program yeah. and have all the components um, work together. So. Um, so anyway, what, you know, in terms of, um, you know, how does somebody, you know, engage with you? Do they, when they call up um, the BH Docs line, are they triaged or do they specifically ask for orthopedic spine or do they tell, how does, how does that work? Um, I think there's two ways. So you can see whoever you want. And so you could call that number one eight three three four BH Docs, and um, oh, that it, was really good, by the way, that you yeah. remembered that. I've used, <laughs> I've used that in my previous podcast. 
<laughs> um, you can call and you can make an appointment with any doctor unless, you know, your insurance says you have to have um, a referral beforehand and then you can get that and then go see whatever doctor you want. Um, the other way is if you have a specific problem, um, you tell um, the scheduling specialist, you know, this is your problem and they'll tell you which doctors take care of that problem and then they will make an appointment that way. Yeah. So, so really from the point at which somebody calls that number mm -hmm. and they enter the system, there's a process of kind of refining, you know, what's the problem, what's the best, quickest way, because mm -hmm. you talked about time to, yeah. you know, to getting somebody back to where they need to be. Um, every part of that process is designed in a way, in a fashion that really kind of optimizes the you know, for the patient, the experience, and yeah. and and how we're going to um, help them get better. So yeah, and um, um, I'm growing my practice. So you know, I'm coming up on a year in February. Um, and uh, one interesting thing is that in your orthopedic training, you spend more time in clinic than you do in the OR. Yeah. And so um, even when I don't do all of the surgeries, and I'm well equipped to kind of sort through the problems and so um, I have a lot of availability and I'm growing my practice so if there's any orthopedic issue or concern anyone can come and see me for any orthopedic problem and um, you know I think uh, availability matters a lot you know there's a yeah what's the financial term for that it's like a it's like it's like a sort of type of capital like opportunity a, cost well it's sort of like availability matters a lot right now. And so um, we're available. So same day appointments a lot of times or next day if you have an orthopedic problem, come in. Yeah, that's awesome. The, um, yeah, it's, it's and, and as you pointed out, you're orthopedic with a spine subspecialty, so yeah. you do all the other orthopedic stuff as yeah. well, um, which is really one of kind of the nice, one of the really good elements of, the way um, you cover each other. Mm -hmm. So one of you is always on call. Yeah. And so if somebody has a fracture, hip fracture, whatever, yeah. you're getting taken care of by, there's always a, a orthopedic surgeon behind that taking mm -hmm. care of you, which is, which is great. Um, so I, and and you know I've been like a, a patient. I'm your yeah, patient. Yeah, I've been yeah, a patient yeah. of. Um, I just had a surgery not that long ago, um, and so I can I can. It's really cool that I can talk about it from a firsthand experience. Mm -hmm. I've been navigating the system, even though, you know, when I go in, I don't wear my ID badge and stuff. I kind of like. It's not really a secret shop, I guess, but <laughs> it works. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it's it's amazing. I mean. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I had a hand surgery, you know, well, it was not my hand, but um, I had two of the surgeons did it at the same time. Yeah. And uh, and Dr. Sorokin and Dr. Lavery. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it was just an incredible experience all the way through. And um, and the recovery was exactly what I thought it was gonna be. And, yeah. Uh, it, was, it was great to experience the team uh, in a horizontal position and come out okay it was yeah. good so the um it's kind of interesting you know i found that you don't see orthopedics as sort of like a primary care specialty yeah but we kind of have turned into that in that um you know our bodies are kind of something's going to come up you know and you want to keep going and if the risk is low and the reward is high, yeah. you know, um, most people are going to um, try to get better so they can continue life as they, the way it is. They don't want to yeah. change their life, you know. They want to sleep. Um, they don't want to stop sleeping. They want to work. <laughs> they don't want to stop working. Yeah. They want to golf. They don't want to stop golfing. Yeah. And as those things come up, um, they come back to the same office. So sort of usually with orthopedics, it's, you want it to be one and done, but it doesn't have to be. And there's a whole range of things that we can offer. And so it could just be, here's a steroid pack for five days to help you come over this flare up of your back pain that you typically have and typically goes away. It could be a cortisone shot, you know, once a year or twice a year to keep some problem that you have under control. It could be, you know, um, taking care of that carpal tunnel this year and then maybe three years down the line you come back because something else is bothering you. 
Yeah. And so um, we just want the community to know that that's what we're here for. Yeah. Sort of like, you know, we're here for the community to help them with what uh, they need help with and not more, not less. It's funny, you just walk through this journey of all those things and I've done all of those things. Yeah, and yeah, I'll yeah. tell you, at different points in time, and it's, yeah. it's made an incredible difference in my life. Yeah. Um, there's no question that, uh, you know, being able to enter the system, do, you know, the, at different levels, shots, whatever, it's it's definitely been a, been a help. So I'm just gonna switch gears a little bit. Sure. So you, you attended the red carpet ball the other night, the yeah. hospital's ball. Yeah. I did not get a chance to see you. I mean, you're, but, you're um, a celebrity, so. No, you know, no, that's not <laughs> true. Not at all. But yeah. um, did you have a good time? It was a good time. Yeah. Good time. I think uh, one of the things that just really shocked me and just was amazing was how many physicians were there. Yeah. And how many physicians stayed till the very end yeah. and danced. Um, it made me feel like incredibly good about the family, the community of the medical staff. Yeah. Um, that it's not just about the work. It's just not about I'm going to come do my thing and go home. They actually really have fun together. Yeah. Um, was uh, so. So what did you think? I mean, that was your first red carpet ball. It's um. It's uh. I think it's everything that you said, you know, like when you have um, a community hospital that's um, big enough that you can take care of all the complex and simple things, but small enough where you can know all the doctors, you kind of get that best of both worlds where everyone knows each other and yeah. everyone can kind of like pull together and also everyone can kind of keep each other accountable too. And, um, you know, when you have family like that, you, you kind of like you work together towards common goals and you have fun together. Yeah. Just like, you know, you go home for the holidays. I know every, there's always, you know, stories about how like people have family strife during the holidays, but most of the time everyone's having yeah. a good time and relaxing, you know, and um, the, uh, I think it was just another expression of that. So yeah. um, everyone was looking good, feeling good. Um, and uh, it was a good, it was a good party. I was pretty impressed with some of the dance moves from some of the doctors, yeah. you know, cause you know, as you were, you were talking about how much education, how much time you spend in training. And, yeah you know, all the sleepless nights and, yeah. and, and um, all the studying and exams and everything yeah. else that you have to take. Um, you know, I always kind of think to myself, you know, you don't get to do some of the things that other people do. No, nah, that students party and so do residents. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was yeah. really, it was really impressive to see yeah. everyone just really kind of kicking back and having a good time. And, and the other thing about that, that's really cool is it's a, it's a, um, it's really about supporting the organization, mm -hmm. you know, giving back to the organization and helping us um, attach with the community, support and raise money and, and do the things that we need to do, get mm -hmm. all the stuff that we need to get, excuse me. And it, it was just an incredible night. Um, and it was good to be back in person again too, yeah. after two years of not being in person. So um, that, that was uh, another incredible part of it. Um, so we have a golf outing coming up. Um, now, are you going to be out on the golf course? I got to fine tune my game for it, but I'll be ready. <laughs> I'll be ready. When? when? It's, um, I think it's in May. May, I'll be usually ready. Usually it's in May. Um, I will be ready. And uh, it's, it's usually very well attended. And yeah. it's a great fundraiser for the hospital. We have a lot of fun. Um, and then, uh, and then we have our wine tasting at the end of the year where okay. we, we, we usually do, uh, we have that event. So three main events, but um, they're usually really well attended and great. Um, but, you know, I'm just hoping that, the, that this, there's this continued kind of family sense of the physicians. And, you know, the other thing that's really kind of interesting about the organization is the medical group is really the governing board of that is the employed physicians, right? Mm. So how, you know, your experience with that kind of model. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember when you came and we were going through your interview process and I talked a lot about it. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's, I mean, now that you've kind of lived in it for a year, how do you feel about the way we, the, the physicians are actually the majority of the board of directors of, of the multi-specialty group? Hmm. That's an interesting question. Yeah. I hadn't uh, thought about that. I think um, 
I think it's helpful um, for the physicians, you know, um, because I guess the decision making and the decision makers in that regard also have the clinical background. Yeah. And so um, they can understand uh, sort of maybe all sides of uh, whatever issue might come up that you would require, you know, a governing body. Yeah. And so they can understand, you know, the clinical issues, they can understand interpersonal issues. And I think it's sort of, it can be fair that way. Yeah. It, it's um, this whole concept of, of uh, shared governance or self-governance mm -hmm. makes so much sense to me. And, and we have that model throughout the organization in nursing, for example, where mm -hmm. Magnet Hospital would share governance and um, it's staff leading staff. Mm -hmm. It's peers leading peers. And it absolutely creates and supports this kind of culture of, of togetherness. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, and it, I guess the other thing that happens that, um, a lot of people don't see this connection, but high reliability, this, the sense of safety and security that outcomes are going to be good, mm -hmm. really require a culture of, um, no fear. Like, you mm -hmm. know, if, if everybody's together, yeah. working together and someone sees something and says, Hey, hold on a second. I have a safety concern. I want to stop yeah. the line. Mm -hmm. It, it happens so much more um, consistently and carefully mm -hmm. um, and appropriately when people feel like there's no fear. I mean, mm -hmm. like, I, I know you, Dr. Brian. Yeah. No, I talk to you. Yeah. I, you know, we just had coffee together. Yeah. And, and maybe I see something that isn't in your sight at that point in time. Yeah. And, you know, you can, you can, can give that feedback. And so I, I feel like this culture that's really evolved and you know grown stronger yeah. and has done so well for the organization in terms of attracting people like yourself mm -hmm. incredible surgeon orthopedic surgeon and it and it's also in a time of incredible turnover in healthcare mm -hmm. and there's a stickiness to the organization so i yeah. feel like you know you're more apt to stay here mm -hmm. if you have friends here yeah. and you have family here, yeah. right? So that's that's kind I think, of the... uh, Maslow's hierarchy. Yeah. <laughs> it's sort of uh you know, we need food, we need shelter, you need work friends. Yeah. And you need uh you need to do meaningful work with people you want to be around. And uh there's no working around that. It has to be fun too, right? It's gotta be fun. You have to feel good about when you walk in the door. Yeah, you know, you know. people have different um, sort of like ideas of fun, you know, yeah. so um, complex problem solving might be fun for some people and boring for others. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's true. and so, um, but yeah, I think uh, I agree with you 100%. Um, that uh, ability to sort of have everyone be on a, a level playing field and everyone feel comfortable stopping the line if they need to for safety is really important. Um, in our OR, we have our safety timeout and everyone, we just start off with everyone saying their, their name, no title and, um, and their role in the case because everyone's role is equally important. You can't, yeah. you can't wash your hands without one hand washing the other. Yeah. You know, that's a good so, point. That's awesome. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, for me personally, the, that cultural that that community that cultural thing is something that you know we, we just celebrated 100 years of operation and yeah. it's and i think it's always been a part of the community mm -hmm. and it's it's what you know what really has made me stay mm. i mean like i feel like this incredible attachment to it and it's the thing that i never want to have end mm. is that is that team that spirit of of how you create great outcomes so mm -hmm. um so let's go back again to how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, so um, there's multiple ways. You can do a quick Google search. You can pick up the phone, call one eight three three four bh docs That's number four, B-H-DOCS, <laughs> Bristol Health Docs. Um, any other ways? 
I think those are I, the main ways. I think you can actually go online to the to the website and oh, request an appointment you can too. Request an appointment. Call, okay. call too, but okay. um, no, that's you got that down. Um, yeah. Now you know, you're gonna gonna shame me into actually trying to memorize that. The, so. uh, <laughs> the office number also five eight five three 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 three. Five eight five three 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 three. I mean, really that's good. Even easier. So, anything so, else you want to say to the audience before we uh, we end this this program today? Uh, Bristol Orthopedics, we're here and we're here for you. Um, come on down if you need help. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Brimo. Really Thank appreciate it. It's been great talking to you today. And, Pleasure's all mine. And I have to tell you personally, I I love that you chose Bristol House to be a part of your family. Well, thank and, you for you having know, me. You you came and. Um, really excited about this and um, and I think you know as this uh, the practice grows and mm -hmm. expands um, I've, I feel really good about what we're doing for this community because you don't you don't need to leave the community to have that no world-class care no there's world-class care right at home oh thank you and, and then we're gonna pull from other places to come to us too yeah well listen um, you have a wonderful holiday season you too. this year, and I uh, wish the best for your family and friends. And again, thank you so much for being here today. Bristol Health Cares. Um, if you have questions or can you know want to have a guest on this show um, or ideas, please please write us. We'll give you some information on how to do that. Contact us and let us know what topics or areas you'd like to have us cover. Um, Dr. Brimo, orthopedic spine surgeon at Bristol Health. Thank you so much, folks. Have a wonderful day.